So the series we started here um, last week is called Unwavering. And the byline is, um, you know, a consistent faith, a resilient faith in a noisy world, in a changing world. Um, and I think that's the world we live in. We're not, going to, um, we're not going to be afraid of that. We're not going to boohoo that. We're going to realize that uh, our world is changing whether we like it or not. Our world is noisy whether we like it or not. But there is a faith that is resilient. There is an unwavering faith in the gospel. And these books, First and Second Timothy, that we're going to be going through, that we're going to start today, um, speak to that. And Paul who wrote the book to Timothy, his son. Timothy wasn't his blood son. Timothy was his adopted son. Timothy's mother was uh, uh, Jewish. His father was Greek. Timothy um, was raised in a small town of Lystra for the most part. And, uh, but yet he came into the faith like a young adult and Paul would be the guy who fathered him. Paul would be the guy who mentored him. Paul would pastor him and Paul would send him out to pastor others. And we're going to get into that over the next few weeks. But in this particular message, this particular week, Paul comes out. He, you know, sometimes Paul is very greetings, bless you, send my greetings. You know, not this one. Paul just comes out firing away saying, Timothy, I want you to pay attention to something. And so that's kind of what today is about, paying yeah, attention. Yeah, he, he, uh, he doesn't write him in Lister either. That's where he grew up. But he left him as a pastor of a metropolitan city of Ephesus. Ephesus would have been a, a more populous, a more modern city than what Timothy had grew, grown up in and, and knew. And he probably was really being thrown for a loop by, by the culture that was around him. And here, here Timothy is going to hear from his spiritual father, uh, what, what does it take to stand firm in a, in a crazy world? So before we, we look at this again, we, can we just pray one more time? Can we just bow your head with me? I just have this sense this morning that... Um, that God wants to do some, I, I don't the word that I have in mind, I'm afraid you're afraid of, but just keep your eyes closed. I feel like he, he wants to do some correcting. Um, don't be afraid of that. If, if I'm, Father, if I'm driving down the road and I, I find I'm, I'm hitting those little uh, bumps on the side of the road, I just correct my steering. I just turn it back into the lane. Now, would you help us pay attention to those, that sound of hitting the rumble strip on the side of the road? I feel like there's people in the room today that are like, man, I, that's been bugging me, that rumble strip thing. The idea isn't to turn up the radio and ignore it. Listen, listen, your father would say, listen. We're going to correct this. We're going to steer back into safety, steer back into what the father has called you to. God, we, we want to be obedient to your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Listen to this passage. We, she read it, but want to just go over it. The aim of our charge is love. If um, anybody who does archery, it's bow season right now. I think the last day is today, someone told me. May you get your elk. People but, were showing me pictures of elk after yeah, the uh, second yeah. service. Yeah. It's kind of the culture in Oregon, right? They don't do that in New York. But the... Uh, Picture an archery target, right? I don't know, four feet wide, five feet wide, and it has these concentric circles, different colors. And at the center is the bullseye. I want to hit the bullseye. I want to hit that center. And that center is smaller. It's the smallest of all the circles. Paul's going to describe, he says, what we're aiming for, he says, is a love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. That's the target. That's the bullseye. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussions. Some translations would say just babblings, foolish, worthless babblings. They desire to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. So Paul is warning them. He's saying, listen, here is the bullseye. Here's what you aim for. And again, we don't hit the bullseye every time, do we? We don't become, you know, we practice, we, we become consistent. And we realize there's, there's other things you can hit, right? But Paul says, this is what we're after. It's like this triad of virtues. These three things together make up this incredible synergistic love, this, this, this life we call Christian life, the following of Jesus. Um, 
Have you ever heard this? If you've, if you've ever shot anything, whether it be a rifle or a bow or a BB gun, doesn't matter. Uh, aim small, miss small. Right? Aim small, miss small. What do, they, what do they mean when they say that? Like, aim small, miss small. They're saying don't aim for the target, aim for the bullseye. You know, just saying, ah, I just want to get it on the target. Aim, aim for the bullseye. And then in the, the, the tighter you aim, the tighter you'll hit. And Paul is really drilling down here. Like, yeah, there are, there are, like Bruce said, there's other things out there. There are valuable things out there, but we're going to aim for love. And, and here's, here's how I aim. I, I aim through a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Now, those, are, those are big asks in, in a lot of ways, but they're not necessarily complicated, right? It's not that I really don't understand any of these words. No, those, those words are relatively clear. They're not hard to understand. They're, they're not complicated, but just because something's not complicated doesn't mean it's not hard, right? Sometimes I'll have that discussion with people around marriage. I'll say, actually, marriage isn't complicated. You just lay down your life for the other person. That's not complicated. It's easy to understand, but it's incredibly hard to do because I want to serve me. It's like saying, like, hey, the weightlifting isn't hard. You just lift that weight up off the floor. And just cling and jerk it. I don't know what that means. They call it a cling and jerk. I've always wondered, which part's the cling? Who's the jerk? <laughs> it's not complicated at all, but it might be incredibly hard. And, and this, this, what we're talking about, love, is maybe beyond hard. I, I would say that all of Scripture would tell you, actually, it's impossible. You won't do this outside of Jesus. The, Jason doesn't do this. I don't wake up. I don't know. Maybe you guys wake up like uh, Disney princesses and there's just a bird, you know, singing and you're just like so happy to greet the day. And I can't wait to just love my coworkers today. And I just, I'm going to just give of myself from morning till evening. No, I, I, I don't wake up like that. I, I wake up still selfish Jason and I need Jesus in my life. I need the Holy Spirit in my life to live anything like a, having a pure heart, a good conscience and a sincere faith. So at the center, I think we have to define who is this God we, we follow and, and what does it mean to be saved by him? What does it mean that he is my only hope of salvation? That's that center. That's that thing that, if, that binds us together in perfect unity, the writers of the gospels or the writers of the epistles would describe. He's this, he's this center. And in this center of, of Jesus is this road that he invites us to follow. He said, listen, broad is the way that leads to destruction. So you can just, you know, you can shoot the arrow anywhere you want, but this road that leads to me, he said, is a narrow road. So I have to define who is this. I have to decide, I should say, who is this that calls me to follow him? And what does that road look like that I put my feet on every day, that I, that I get up every morning and decide it's not just a one-day-a-week, but it's a seven-day-a-week uh, adventure? How you answer the question that he's describing there, who God is, how you answer that question will determine everything else about your life. I promise. Whether you're a believer or unbeliever, whatever you think about God, you may say he, he is not, he doesn't exist. Well, that'll determine the direction of your life, the direction it takes. If you think, well, there is a God and, and he's, you know, he's serious, man, and you better be serious because he's just waiting for you to, then that's going to determine the way you live your life. But if you understand God to be the God of the Bible as, as perfectly, perfectly represented in Jesus Christ, that Jesus was the exact representation of the Father. If you know that to be true, then that's going to define your life. And, and Paul is really, he's, as he's describing this to Timothy, he's saying, look, if you know God to be love, you're on solid ground. And he says, what does it look like to, to swerve off of that? He uses that word several times, swerve. He uses three times, both in Timothy and in, in the, uh, the book of Titus, which are all his letters to pastors. He talks about swerving or veering or wavering. And, and he says, this is what, what you waver into if you leave that path. He says, you waver into, this is verse uh, 10 and 11, you waver into whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. That's where you land. You land on bad doctrine. It says, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of, the, of blessed God. And there's, there's a gospel of the glory of the blessed God. That is good, sound doctrine. But if you leave this path of love, you wander into bad doctrine. I know I just say that word and you can feel like, oh, we're going to get to the boring part of the message. We're going to talk about doctrine. It, 
Doctrine is just who God is and how to live according to that. That's what it is. And Paul is convinced that it is incredibly, incredibly important. He uses the word doctrine 15 times in First and Second Timothy. So he has, he has it on a very high shelf, right? He thinks this is incredibly important. Why? Because if we get our doctrine wrong, we get God wrong. If we get our doctrine wrong, we get God wrong, and he wants Timothy to understand who God is. Think about this. What he just said, if we get doctrine wrong, we get God wrong. But not only that, if we get God wrong, we get everything else is skewed as well. Think about that. Think of the, all, the, all the discussions and arguments and, and debate and endless internet you know, opinions. If, if I get doctrine wrong about who God is, I'm going to get God wrong. I'll, I'll end up with maybe a piece of God, but he's usually created in my own image. <laughs> and, and I'm at the center. I'm at the center of that bullseye. And then it cannot help but follow that I'll get everything else wrong as well. Uh, Taylor mentioned what I do with my money, my sexuality, my goals, my identity, my relationships, Everything will be skewed. Now, I'm speaking from a premise here. The premise is that God is the creator and the maintainer of all things. He's the supplier of all things. So that means everything that my life relates to. See, it's not only about God, but it's also about everything God created. That's the center. Because then if God is God, he has the right as the creator and the sustainer to speak into every area of my life, to speak into my ambitions, to speak into our, our struggles, to speak into our conflict, to speak into the pain we've experienced. He speaks to all those things. But if God is not in the center, guess what? I'm going to interpret all those things. I'm going to interpret. And that wandering is, 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 is a, dangerous, a dangerous wandering. It says in verse 4, it says, don't let, them, let those people devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Because all they do is promote speculation rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. That's what this wandering looks like. They devote themselves to myths, endless arguments. The word genealogy there is just, again, it's, it's this, everything in those outside circles, right? Those, those outside, those perimeters, if you will, those margins of our lives. And there's plenty of stuff. To, uh, to argue about. And listen, he's talking about the church. He says there were people yeah. within the community who they started aiming at love, but then they got distracted. And, then they, and where your eye goes, that's, where, that's your target. You're following it. And so they're now they're completely missing the target. Have you, uh, what we're talking about is attention, right? Where do I give my attention? And that's one of the things I like about hunting. I don't get to do a lot of it. But when you're hunting, it has to take all of your attention, right? All of your senses are focused on one thing. You don't walk around with earbuds in when you're hunting because you need to be listening. You don't, you know, you, your, your eyes are open. You're checking out everything. And listen, we are a distracted people. Come on. We are so distracted. And I'm telling you, there is a war for your attention right now. There is a battle for your attention. Uh, I'll describe what that looks like in my life because I'll, I'll fail in this area over and over again and realize I've done it again. I've done it again. Uh, not that long ago, I was, trying to put, um, I was trying to put a string on my weed eater. And I, and I couldn't get string on my weed eater. So I'm like, what do you do if you can't, you know, and I'm a modern man, I go to YouTube. I go to YouTube and I'm like, you know, this, I got this weed eater, I got this model, how do you get string on this? And God bless this old man who made this video. <laughs> he's got 12 views, but he's out there, man. He's yeah. trying to do this thing. And I watch him and I'm like, oh, okay, that's how he did it. Fantastic. But then while I'm watching, it takes up the most of the screen, but then on the side of the screen are all these other little videos. And remember, what am I supposed to be doing? The goal is weed eating. But I see these other videos and I'm like, well, that, how did he do that? I'm going to just click on that. An hour later, I'm learning how to make soap. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, what was I doing here? What am I, what am I doing? And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I'm supposed to be outside weed eating. And now I'm thinking about starting a new business as a soap maker. I don't even like, like, I don't even, how did, I, how did this happen? And I'm, I'm telling you, they know. And I'm not, I say they, it starts to sound like a conspiracy. 
But there is a conspiracy, an evil conspiracy. Sorry, I'm going to be that guy today. And I don't think it's the guy who ever owns YouTube. I don't even know. Is that Google that owns that? I don't blame them. There's an enemy who just wants to keep you looking at other things, right? And if he can get you off of the aim of love and, and just like, hey, can we just talk about the, the dimensions of the temple for a little while? Because they think it's that over there. But I think, doesn't that mean this? And what, you know, what do you think that pomegranate meant in that verse? And, and we get distracted. And, and those things are of value. They are of value. They're just not the most valuable thing. And listen, um, doctrine is incredibly valuable. Paul is saying it is incredibly valuable here. But it is a means to an end. It's not the end. It's, it's the means to get you to the end of knowing who God is and living a godly life. And if you let it, you'll just let it be intellectual. I know things. I know things. I don't know if you know this, but I took a class and I know things. My theology is right and yours is a little, so let me correct you. And now it hasn't humbled me. It's actually made me proud. Even if I'm right, I can still end up being wrong of heart and spirit. If it's not taking you in the direction of love, then you've wandered. You've, you've veered off, Paul says, into dangerous territory. How many hours you have in your day, Brian? 24. 24. Wow. <laughs> um, and, and anybody else have 24 hours in, in their day? That's me. That's what we all have in common. No one gets more. No one gets less. We get 24. And so this competition for our attention, it's interesting that, like Jason said, it's monetized. That's why they call it clickbait. Because if we can just get you to look at this, just give us 30 seconds you know, even, even if you watch, like you're trying to watch a video, but an ad comes on and it'll tell you 30 seconds. You go, okay, I'm going to endure this. And you just, okay, and then you can skip the ad, right? Or whatever. The Christian life, the following of Jesus, rises and falls on my ability, our ability to pay attention to God. The Christian life, the ability to follow Jesus rises and falls. I mean, God's in charge. God is sovereign, and he invites me every morning to pay attention to him, or late in the evening, or whatever that is, or throughout the day, when I'm trying to make a decision, or when I feel like something's coming at me, or when I'm struggling with my identity, or when I'm struggling with criticism, or when I'm trying to figure out how that bill's going to get paid. Now, what's right there with me is pay attention to worry, pay attention to fear, pay attention, pay attention. You should be afraid. You should be afraid. Why is that? Because fear sells. And Jesus says, no, no, look at me. Look at me. Pay attention right now. Have I ever failed you? Don't we have history together, you and I? Listen, and that thing, is the attention is worth a lot, the ability. Now, I don't know if you're like me, uh, it's like Jason said, it's a struggle because there are just, I sit down early in the morning, that's kind of my zone and whether I'm studying or whatever and I, and I just want to turn off the noise. But man, in my head is the list of things to do. And then I look at my, if I, if I look at my phone, there's, oh gosh, there's 14 emails and six tests messages and maybe they're important and then it just goes on and on it's all downhill from there so I have to make a deliberate decision who's going to get and how they're going to get a piece of that 24 hours so the question I want you to ask yourself for a minute is who are you going to let direct your attention who are you going to let direct your attention there's you know even as Bruce said that about the noise there's the outside noise that we all, like, it's just, it's the world we live in. And unless you're just going to go completely off grid, right, and unplug from everything, there's going to just be this cultural noise that says, over here, over here, hey, pay attention to this. But to be honest, even if I go out, you know, I just went on vacation and we went out in the middle of nowhere and it was beautiful and great. I can turn everything off and you know what? I, the noise has followed me. It's inside of me. I... I I hate to tell you this, but you've heard this, this phrase, you've been around in our culture, I'm sure you've heard it before, intrusive thoughts. I got intrusive thoughts. All right, that, what is an intrusive thought? It's like, it's a thought I don't want in my head, but there it is. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear this is failing, you're, you're weak, what are you thinking, that was a stupid thing you said. 
Those aren't things I want to hear, but there it is right there. And if, if, if I let it, those outside thoughts and those inside thoughts will take my attention off of God. And listen, I want you to listen to someone who knew this very well because he, he learned a, a very hard and dangerous lesson. It was, it was King David. There was a time in his life when he was laser focused on God. And it was a simpler time in his life when he was just a sheep herder and he could just sing songs to, to the God of the universe and look at the stars. And, but then he became king and suddenly with that came a whole lot of wealth and a whole lot of privilege and a whole lot of... And he let his eyes wander off of the God of the universe and onto his creation. And it nearly destroyed him. And afterwards, when he recovered and in God's grace and mercy repented and, and been restored, he says this, I will sing a steadfast love and justice to you, O Lord. I will make music. I will ponder, listen, he's talking about his attention. I will ponder the way that is blameless. Oh, when will you come with me? I will walk with integrity of heart within my own house. I will not set before my eyes anything that's worthless. He's making a value call. I have looked at worthless things and I realize where they lead me. He says, I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. He's talking about himself. A perverse heart shall be far from me. I will know nothing of evil. He's had to make a determination. He says, man, I went down a path that nearly destroyed me and now I have narrowed my focus. I am not going to do this. I'm going I'm to ponder what is good, what is holy, what is right. I'm cutting some things out of my life. I would encourage you, meditate on that scripture and ask God, God, is there places that other people have directed my attention or I've allowed my attention to wander into unholy things and it's, it's leading me into a ditch? <laughs> you know, the last thing in the world that I'd like to be is the internet police or the media police right. or... Things like that, because it's just it's a it's a losing game. In other words, if all if my whole life is just playing defense, mm -hmm. then you know eventually I'll be scored on. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I was reflecting on this this week, and uh, has anybody here? Or is it just me? Have you ever just got home at night and you worked hard? You're kind of tired, and and you just kind of plop down and turn on the television and open that big bag of chips and. I'm just going to eat a few and just sit here for a couple minutes. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Everybody's laughing right now. Eat just one, right? Mm -hmm. And then before you know it, you've been there 90 minutes and you ate the entire bag of chips. <laughs> Which chips are they? I, well, Fritos. Whatever, yeah, your, 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 your habit is or your addiction is, right? But, <laughs> but think about it. Is there anything wrong with having a few chips or turning on the television? Probably not. What's... At play, I think, is, is a hunger, right? Is a hunger that um, I, just, I just need to relax a little bit. I need to, and, and you know, they, isn't it interesting that they've taken food and tied it to an emotion? They call it comfort food, right? Oh, that's my comfort food, right? Is it, they say, oh, I, I used to binge on food, but now I binge on Netflix. Isn't it crazy how they've mixed the metaphors, so to speak, the words that describe it, the adjectives. Well, I thought that was, I thought binging was about, oh, that's about just watching something that kind of titillates your, your thinking. Is that what we're talking about? You see, my point here is this, is that at, at just like I have 24-7, just like you and I, listen, I have to sometimes, you know, in fasting, or if you just eat too much and you go to a doctor and they said, you know, there's nothing wrong with you except you eat too much. And so we're going to put you on a diet and call it whatever you want, a keto diet or this diet or that diet, but we're going to limit the intake. Isn't that true? We're going to limit the intake. Or maybe, maybe you're super, you know, maybe you're, you're, you're a little bit more spiritual than that and you say, God, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to fast. And who's here has ever fasted a meal or more? You've, ever, you've said no to food. It's, and when you go to fast, does your, does your flesh just go, oh, I've been waiting for this. I don't get to eat for a day or two. No, no, it just screams like a, like a, like a small child. No. Right? But what happens? No, here's the point. What happens when you say no to food? Something happens spiritually. All of a sudden, the noise level drops. 
It might take a few hours, it might take a day, it might take two days, but you're going to find anybody who's fasted from food will tell you, man, it just seems like all these, what was the word, intrusive thoughts. And I can just feel like I can relax, I can think, well, what about the, what about the fasting of noise? What about if we said, you know, I'm going to go on an internet fast for a few days. I'm going to go away and I'm not going to take, I'm, I'm going to leave home tomorrow without my phone. What? You know, they didn't have phones not too long ago. That's a whole other old guy story. But, you know, that's a relatively new thing, right? What if we said no to the noise for the better of just saying, I want to be able to pay attention to God? Hmm. You know, um, here's Paul trying to give Timothy and, and now a couple thousand years later, trying to, trying to just give us mm-hmm. some powerful tools to survive shaking. As Paul knows, he's, he's already receiving the beatings. He's already, you know, getting arrested and getting sued and getting drug out of town and stoned at the edge of town. These are all things that happen in Paul's life. And now he's telling Timothy, man, I, I want to set you up, man. I, I want to leave you with an inheritance. And I've learned a few things. I've learned things that keep me on the path. I've learned things that make me wander. And I'm telling you, aim at love. And, and, and your doctrine is going to be really, really important, Timothy. I want you to pay attention to your doctrine, that what you know about God, what you believe about God, and how you, how you live that. And Paul knew something incredibly important, though, that getting it right, in that, even in that area of, of doctrine and, and knowledge, so that you can get it right in the area of how to, how to live, is a, is a dangerous thing. Now listen, I am so pro-education. I really am. So don't let anything I'm about to say make you believe otherwise. I'm 100% for educating yourself. But Bible college is a dangerous thing. I, I, don't, I wish it didn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. But it can be. Meaning, like, I can go to a place that has all the answers and get the correct information from some of the best teachers in the world and feel like that has changed me. And now I'm a different person because now I know, I can tell you exactly how this is supposed to be done. But all that's done is inform your intellect and make your intellect feel a little swollen. But if you don't actually practice it, it will, it will leave you in a broken place of pride and believing that you're better than others. But Paul didn't have that privilege because he'd gotten the pride the stuffing uh, beat out of him on the road to Damascus. Because you didn't have better answers than, than Saul did, I promise you. He knew his stuff. And it didn't lead him to love, it led him to murder. But he encountered, he experienced the God of the universe, blasted him into blindness, blasted him into the kingdom of God. No, I don't know anyone else has been saved like Paul got saved. It blasted him into the kingdom of God and he was completely transformed of it. And he could say, like Job said at the back of the book of Job, he said, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. Nobody had heard more truth about God than Saul. Job said, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye has seen you and therefore I repent in dust, dust and ashes. Now I don't just know about you, I know you. And, and Paul knew, I am known by God. He looked into my heart and he saw murderous rage. He didn't say, see purity. He didn't see a, 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 a pure heart, a sincere faith at all. And now I can't only be known by God, I have to be known by this family of God. And he was integrated into the family of God, the very people he used to kill. And so when Paul stands and is really harsh with people with bad doctrine, he knows what he's talking about. He knows where that road leads. He's telling, he's telling them, I, look, I've been down the legal road. I can tell you exactly where it goes. And he describes it. He, he, he says it right here. Look, at, look with us in verse 13. I'm so excited about this. I'm stuttering. I apologize. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent but I received mercy because I'd acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with a faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And let me tell you, Timothy, this saying is absolutely true. It's trustworthy, it's deserving of full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and I am the foremost. And he meant it, this wasn't false humility. 
And then he goes on to say, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost of sinners, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. It's like he explodes into praise here and he says, to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever, amen. He's describing, I'd, I'd, I went into a ditch. Don't go in that ditch, man. He's telling Timothy, don't listen to them. Don't, don't wander off into vain speculation. And I'm telling you, aim at love, son. Aim. Unwavering is going to be our theme over the next seven or eight weeks. And I invite you to come along. We're going to share communion together. And um, uh, communion, the Lord's Supper, is this laser focus of everything that God has done through His Son, Jesus, on our behalf. We take it together. We take it recognizing what God has done. We take it recognizing that, listen, like Paul, man, I'm a candidate for God's grace. I'm not better than you. I'm not smarter than you. I'm a candidate for God's grace. Hmm. Yeah, the, the elements are in the, the front and the back. If you'll just collect the, the bread and the wine, just hold on to it, and then we'll all take together like a family.